thank you everyone for coming. I think it's about 3.40, so we'll get started shortly. Um, so this is, uh, in some ways, just a continuation of our last session in here, um, just more ways of using technology to share our stories and our content, our, our education with the public in less formal ways. Um, and our first step is Julie Weisenhorn sharing about how she uses Qualtrics, so that's a survey platform, um, to educate about pollinators. Yeah, I'm going to go to sleep with it that dark. Yeah, I just, yeah, we can just. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Allison, and thank you for uh, allowing me to come here to present to you about a. Uh, a survey that we did in uh, uh, horticulture. I'm an extension educator in horticulture at the University of Minnesota and uh, came over from the St. Paul campus, the farm campus, to uh, speak to you all about this. And uh, I wanted to talk with you today about a, um, I have to find my clicker here. Is this the right one? Oh, no, I'll just, you know what, I'm just standing here. I'll use the old-fashioned way here. Uh, so this is a survey called How Pollinator Friendly Is Your Landscape? And as Allison said, it uses a tool called Qualtrics, which is a great survey tool that we utilize here. We've been using it for a few years here at the U of M. And one of the nicest things about it is it creates some pretty darn good reports for us that we can uh, easily uh, accommodate. Regina McGough is the one who should be talking about this. She's in our... Uh, Dean's office, and she does uh, a lot of the help with that. Allison was on this project as well. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we did this survey and some of the results that we got. So the first thing was, uh, in, in horticulture, we've been working very hard since probably around 2011, 2010, to raise pollinator awareness and to make an effort on encouraging people to do all that they can, big or small, in their home landscapes about uh, uh, working with pollinators and planting for pollinators. I work primarily with consumers, so I'm working with homeowners, master gardeners, kids, that kind of thing. Uh, not so much in the commercial, a little bit with pesticide trainer uh, training, pesticide applicator training. But one of the uh, focuses that the Minnesota Department of Ag had a number of years ago was that we uh, get more involved with the pollinator uh, effort. And we have the bee squad at the university. We've got Marla Spivak, who is uh, uh, an excellent and uh, premier researcher in bee health. And so in horticulture, we wanted to find out a little bit more and raise people's awareness about how friendly is their landscape, is their yard and garden for bees and for other pollinators. So we uh, created a few uh, things like this uh, Flowers for Pollinators program. We also have uh, kids programs in this. I've done a four-year study called Flowers for Pollinators, which looks at annual flowers and their attractiveness to pollinators. And then also we have living laboratories on campus. Uh, this is, mine is uh, Flowers for Pollinators over on the St. Paul campus. And then we've done an awful lot of teaching with uh, people of all ages from youngsters to seniors on what they can do to plant for pollinators. So the survey was started in 2017 and really what we wanted to do is first of all get people interested in, in assessing how pollinator friendly their landscape is, their plant material that they have, uh, how much they know about it, whether they even see pollinators in their landscapes. And so we created a survey and we released it at the state fair, so on August 29th, 2017, and we called it How Pollinator Friendly Is Your Landscape? It was eight questions, and essentially those eight questions dealt with what insects do you see in your landscape? We had pictures that people could click on. Uh, pollinator, uh, act, or the uh, flower diversity, so do you plant flowers of different sizes, different colors, different, uh, different bloom times? Habitat, do people cut down stems for pollinators? Do they have pollinator habitat that they encourage in their landscape? And then ultimately, what is their chemical use? And we didn't, we really, really worked on that question because we didn't want it to be something that, that was all about the pesticide use. We wanted it to be more about what are they actually doing in their landscape now. So we have uh, this survey still open. You're welcome to take the survey on your own. 
Uh, but uh, as of January, we had 67 of our 87 com uh, counties represented in responses. We had just under 1,400 responses, and we scored those responses. We allowed people to score them. Brenda. So Julie, how did you go about getting these out to people? This oak, thank you. Well, at the State Fair, we actually stood in the horticulture building, and we tapped people and asked them to take away iPads. I had a group of master gardeners, and we actually stood there, and we had people take the, take the test or the survey them. I should call it a test. We had them take the survey themselves. So we started with that, and then we also did a lot of uh, uh, promotion through our website, web pages. Uh, I've done lots and lots of these talks, so I've, I've talked a lot about it. I've, we've kind of spread this around. We've also put it in our Yard and Garden News, which is a blog. I've got some uh, links for that at the end. And we've had people, when people took this uh, Qualtrics survey, they actually got a score at the end. And the scores were divided into three levels. Uh, one was, you know, pollinator protector. That was the 18 to 26, 26 being the highest score people could have. And when they scored that, if they put in their email at the end, they got a printout of their answers and the correct answers or, uh, you know, what, what we recommend. And then also they got a whole bunch of resources that were geared toward that level. So if they scored 24 out of 26, they obviously are well on their way to understanding pollinator habitat and, and what insects are pollinators, etc. So they might have gotten kind of a higher level of resources versus somebody who scored that lower seven or less are obviously not very much in the know. This, they're just on the beginning level. They're at you know, stage one of learning about pollinators. So they got resources that were maybe a bit more basic, just to kind of get them going. And uh, if they included their email, and 312 people did, and then they received back an email that gave them their score, their answers, and then also these resources. So they got something back for what they did. So what's so unique in about this, an online survey? Everybody does online surveys. Well, one of the things we did, too, is because we had those 312 emails and we indicated this on the survey that we might be emailing them for more information, we actually got, uh, we, we uh, sent a follow-up survey in December of 2018. We got a 44% return, which is pretty darn good, I guess, according to, <laughs> according to Regina and the people who do this on a regular basis. And we reminded them of the original survey. So we were really looking at what's the effect of the survey, of just taking the survey and getting those answers back. So the first question starts out, after taking the survey, and we had three questions for them, we kept it super short, uh, change in gardening practices, and almost 80% reported some change in gardening practices, which was terrific. That's wonderful. And then we got a little more specific and we asked, what things have you changed? So leaving stem standing, you can see a little over 18% said they do that now. Looked for pollinator-friendly plants and seeds when they went to go buy plants and seeds for last year's growing season. We have just under 18%. And then looking for and observing pollinators, we had a little over 18% looking for those two as well. So all great things. Those people are on their way to doing a better job and understanding that. We also ask them, for education ideas, because of course that is what we are interested in doing, is providing additional education in places that people want to learn more about. So one of the things, respondents see and recognize different insects in their landscapes. That was one of the, one of the conclusions we made. And the education ideas, and these came directly from them, they want to know more about specific pollinator life cycles. They wanted to know about bee lawns, very popular topic right now, very popular. And then they wanted to see specific plants for specific pollinators. And in fact, I can remember the answer. I want to know what plants bumblebees want, to, want in my garden. So they got really down to kind of pretty particulars. They wanted no, to know more about habitat and nesting areas. But we found that this was probably not really understood that well because 74% of people or so responded. Well, a third people said they did not leave stem standing. And about half of the people say that they found uh, ground nesting bees alone or they never saw them. So it could be that they have no clue what they're looking for. So that gives us great ideas about pollinator education and about the kind of the do-it-yourself, what can people do in their landscapes, what, you know, why would you leave these stems standing, how does it work? 
Pollinator flowers were a popular portion of this as well. Bloom time was very interesting because most people, what we asked them is, in the months of April, May, June, July, August, September, October, click on the month that you have something blooming in your yard. Could be trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, what have you. And so we had a beautiful bell curve, as you might imagine. Lots of stuff blooming June, July, August, and then it tapered off toward fall, and it just started in April a little bit. 10% of people reported that they had something blooming in their yard in April. So right there, we knew on those shoulder seasons of April and October, early spring, late fall, we need to do a better job of telling people what they could plant for pollinators that are arriving early or emerging early, and the pollinators that are sticking around up until the cooler weather. So that was a big, uh, a big eye-opener for us. And then they reported growing lots of kinds of flowers of various forms and colors. Some of the things they wanted to know more about was that bloom time list. When do things bloom? When can I get these plants? Reliable sources for the plants. And then also, where can I find pesticide-free plants? Now that's a little tricky for universities. <laughs> because we are not supposed to be biased to one vendor or another, but we have a wonderful tool through the Arboretum Library, the Anderson Horticultural Library called Plant Information Online. And it's a database managed by our librarians there, and every year, throughout the year, they're entering in information, resources for plants and seed, and citations about plants and seed online. It's plant information, uh, Plant, the Plant Information Online database. It's plant in, I think it's called plantinfo.umn.edu. Great resource. So right there, we can send people to that information. 85% of people reported growing a combination of native and non-native plants. I was very surprised at this because you think that the people taking the survey are going to be pretty hip to pollinators, that they've probably got a fairly good uh, sense of pollinators and what pollinators want. And I thought, oh, we're going to get a ton of people who are native plant purists. That's fine. Great. But we had 85% of people who reported that they plant a combination. Now, 74% of people answered that question, which tells me 25% of people either didn't know what kind of plants they had at all, or at least they didn't know are they native or non-native. So education ideas about those plants would be helpful, including good identification, so that maybe if they're a new homeowner and they have a whole yard and they've never had a yard before and they have no idea what's growing there, that they'll be able to actually identify some of their plants. One of the nice questions, uh, or one of the big questions that people ask are what are industry and agencies doing to increase pollinator protection? They asked whether planting more natives along roadsides, are agencies doing that? Are they making pollinator-friendly lawn care the norm instead of the exception? Uh, they, are the city parks doing more with that? And where can I find those reliable plant sources? So they're really in tune with thinking about what's my, uh, what are my tax dollars going toward to help pollinators. So how might we expand on this information? Well, master gardener education, that's been a big part of this, uh, kind of stemming from all of this flowers for pollinators information, including things about habitat. They're our extension for extension in horticulture, so we rely on them. There's over 2,300 in Minnesota, and, uh, and those people are doing some important work out there when we, as educators, can't be in front of folks. And so helping us with all of these different topics and going to conferences and speaking and being one-on-one -on -one with community gardens and also answering people's, uh, answering homeowners' information. We produced a whole toolkit for them called Flowers for Pollinators and it's now going into its third year of use. So we did trainings around the state and, uh, and so the survey kind of comes out of that. Public education, we want to continue to raise people's awareness. So the survey is still open and we've uh, pulled down information a little bit, like for this uh, discussion today. Early success is important, we believe, with people, with any kind of a gardening effort or landscaping effort. You've got to get that first step where you feel successful. Grow the one tomato plant that produces tomatoes that you actually can eat. Grow, those, grow some of those pollinator plants where you actually see the bumblebees coming to those plants. You feel successful. It's just a little step, but it's what people need to go to the next step 
and become uh, more versed in pollinator habitat. So providing education opportunities, we uh, do a lot with our extension content, with our bee squad information, making those resources accessible to people is important as well, and then using sign signage and labels and anything that we can do to remind people about planting for pollinators is important. We want people to protect pollinators and adopt a philosophy about that, uh, choosing plants that are, uh, that are pollinator friendly, being a role model in your neighborhood, encouraging people to do that as well, and then learning to apply any pesticides correctly. Now, ideally, there's no pesticides in a pollinator-friendly landscape, but occasionally you get to a point where you don't really know what to do. So understanding the correct way to use, to use pesticides, to choose the least impact is important as well. And then maintaining yards and gardens for habitat, creating that through the stem nesting, and the leaf litter, promoting seasonal lawn bloom, and then planting natives and cultivars with minimal to moderate modifications. So what is that about? That's something we get a lot of questions about. It has to do with that native and non-native plant. So we, this is uh, adapted from Annie White from Nectar Landscape Design Studio. She was a, a student at uh, University of Vermont, I believe it was. And she was able to really put this information in an easy to understand uh, format. So looking for best, pollinate, best for pollinators are unmodified, in other words, our natives. Then those minimally, minim, minimally modified. So in this case, it's a cultivar called Bravado of Echinacea purpurea. So that right there gives us a really good way that people can look at that. They can see pictures like that and say, oh, okay, I see where they're similar. Good for pollinators are moderately uh, modified. So here we have Fragrant Angel, that's the white one that you see, the third one. And then we want to avoid these highly modified plants. So this is a way people can take this information and they can go to the garden center and they can say, I want a plant that looks pretty much like this, but I want the flowers a little bit bigger. I like this one with the big flowers. Is this going to be, this looks pretty similar to uh, the native plant. So there's good ways to do this, a lot of visual stuff. And that's what we did with this survey as well. So just for some uh, information about the resources that we have on our yard and garden website, we took this information and we've been adding to that. There's been a big facelift to that data, to that website. We've added a section called native plants. It has a section called flowers for pollinators. It also has a bee lawn section that's underneath our turf section. And we have the link there if you're interested in taking a look at any of those. And then we have our yard and garden news blog. It's published every two weeks. It's written about current information. We included a video. One of the difficult things with that nesting habitat was how do you explain to people to cut the hollow stems at a certain height? And what do you do with the hollow stems? And, and how does that work? And what about leaf litter? Like how deep does it have to be? And as you all know, it's easier to show somebody some of these things rather than try to write something about it. People don't want to read so much. They want to watch a video. So we did a video this past fall on cleaning up your garden for pollinators. And that was exactly the kind of thing we did. And it was in response to this survey. So we were able to do that. And it's gotten a ton of hits. And it's been very uh, easy to refer people to that who want to know more about that. To the extent where uh, Elaine Evans, who's one of our bee squad experts, an expert particularly in bumblebees, has written an article now in the Yard and Garden News blog that refers back to that and explains, now as you're cleaning up in the spring, pay attention to these as well. Pay attention to the leaf litter. That's where the queen bees hibernate. Put those stems aside. Don't burn them. Don't compost them. They may, be ha they may have eggs in them. They might be used in the future. So we've been kind of gearing our content based on what the surveys told us. Last but not least, we've been looking at things like uh, pollinator habitat and plant diversity, plant lists, classes and plants, resources for plants, choosing plants, best practices and coming up with language that's easy for people to understand. And then pollinator-friendly maintenance and more master gardener education. And then also always valuing the partnerships that we have with community gardens, our municipalities, agencies, master gardeners, other parts of extension. Very important to, to maintain those partnerships to get the information out as well. So that is what I have for you today about this. And if there's any uh, questions, be happy to answer them. Yes. Yes, you know, sitting back and like you watch HGTV 
and they'll throw something on the TV that's just plain wrong. <laughs> yes, I know. Has there been any, any consideration of doing some outreach at the major box retail stores? At like the Home Depots or Home Lowe's Depot, or what have you? Lowe's. We have, uh, we ha I know that in Minnesota we have master gardeners at some of those places who are there then providing the science and research based information that we have. Um, as far as being out there and me standing at a Lowe's or a Home Depot, uh, I would probably end up selling plants. Um, I don't know if they're, unless they're receptive to it, unless that corporation gets on board, it's going to be just you know, talking about you're going to have to just hit one person or another person. They're going to ask you where the bathroom is and they're going to ask you where, where to find, you know, uh, mums and that kind of thing. So there, we haven't really had much, uh, much about, you know, much effort in that area at this point. Yes? So I'm interested in like the survey um, software that you use. Okay. So Qual it's called Qualtrics. Q-U-A-L-T-R-I-C-S. Can we use Qualtrics because it's, the university here has licensed it for our groups and it's right. really robust and it, it has, we have good um, privacy agreements and everything, but it's not the only thing you can use. You can certainly use something like Google Forms or, you know, something that's, that's free if you don't have access mm -hmm. to Qualtrics. I think Qualtrics does have a free version, too, but just, just keep in mind that it just, that doesn't need to be the barrier. Right. I'll show you a little more about what it looks like in my part of the business. Oh, good. Perfect. And then we have some iPads for at the end that you mm -hmm. can you can see like what that experience was like for the people who came to the state fair and filled out Julie's survey and, and try um, Abby's education as well. Yes. For the survey, do you have to do some kind of like human subjects institutional review? Not for this particular type of survey. We didn't uh, really we didn't collect any demographics short of the county that they lived in. We didn't collect age or gender or anything like that. So. Uh, and for this type of a survey, it's an it's up to them if they want to take it. We're you know they're not part of a study, so we it wasn't required. Then one of the nicest things about it is it stay it could stay open, and I think that positioning a survey so that somebody gets something back is important too. Uh, first of all, because it extends their learning. You know, you hope it does. You hope they go back and click on a couple of those links that you sent them. Um, Julie, did you manually have to send them something, or did you program Qualtrics to be able to automatically generate them? The latter. So Qualtrics has a capability of responding back when somebody puts their email address in, and it will, it will then sort, take based on their score, it actually sends out that response back to them or that reply back to them that they would you know, you got this score, and here's what you answered, and here are some great, you know, you're well on, I think we, we even said, you're on your way to being a pollinator protector, and way to go, you know, you scored in the highest top third, and, you know, real encouraging. And it makes people feel a little bit more part of the university when there's that back and forth. And then when they receive the December survey follow-up, they're like, oh, yeah, that's right, you know. So we had, a, we had a pretty good response rate back for that, for the, you know, 44% out of the 312 people who put their email in. That's not too shabby, I guess. <laughs> I think they said the conference participants are going to be getting an email tomorrow on uh, evaluation from this conference, and that will be most likely uh, Walter's generated. But kind of the nice thing about it that I like too, if I send it this out to participants in that I do. Um, it will send email reminders. For example, if you do the survey, it won't remind you because you've already done it. But if you haven't done it yet, you know, I can set it up so in three days or five days, whatever, you'll get a reminder mm -hmm. to do it. And that really increases the amount of responses you yeah. it, it also, if you respond a certain way, and this is common in surveys, if you answer yes, 
instead of having the next question for everybody say, if you answered yes, yeah. it'll actually bump you to another question to say, you answered yes, how did you, what did you do differently or what, it, you know, can, can you tell us more about that or whatever it might be. So that's always, that's great too. That just makes survey taking less stressful for people. They're less likely to opt out of it halfway through. <laughs> Yes. A general comment is I, I went through kind of the survey just to see. Oh, you did. What okay. Were. Yeah. The first thing is submit county because I'm not in and didn't finish it, but I thought it was well done. Thank you. One thing I will say though is I didn't think about like my garden flowers being flowers that would include. I mean. Oh, okay. I know that they're flowers. Sure. I know that they're culinary friendly, but when I'm reading a survey about in my landscape, mm -hmm. I'm thinking my landscape. Yeah, we, we, we went back and forth about that because if you ask, you know, some people that we talked with said, well, you know, not everybody has a yard and garden who will answer this. And you're kind of like, well, then why would they take the survey? But okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> but we thought about that. Should it say yard and garden? Should it be landscape? And that's, we struggle sometimes with the terms because for us, it's just, we know what that means. And so we've really worked hard. We just did a big redesign of our website in the past couple years. And we worked very hard and we were constantly being tapped for, you're being too technical, you've got to explain what this is, or you have to use uh, eighth grade language. That was our level that we had to write at, which floored us. So, so with surveys too, like the question about the habitat, how many people really knew what that stem nesting meant? You know, and if I look back at it now, I would have changed it and probably written, we did do an explanation in there a little bit that bees use hollow flower stems. But you still kind of think, well, how much did somebody read about that? Or did they just skip down to the question, you know, down to the answers there? Well, a picture on that one might have been good. A you picture might have been a good idea. You chop your dead head and leave yeah. standing or, you know. Right, right. Yeah, photos are always much better. I, I thought you were announcing. Except in the case of Megan's manual for doing <laughs> using the camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was all drawings. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And take this survey, pass it around. It's, it's kind of uh, fun to do. If you have more questions, you know where to find me. And I'm happy to answer any more or have a conversation about it. Um, We're going to stay on the Qualtrics train. Um, I'm Abby Noy. I'm an extension educator here also at the University of Minnesota. And I talk to poultry farmers. And I'm going to talk to you today about why I actually even have a job. How many of you actually work with livestock? All right. Does this map look familiar to any of you? Besides the fact that it's the United States of America. This is a map of the infected states in 2014 and 2015 that were affected by highly pathogenic avian influenza. Okay. It was the biggest animal health emergency in the United States. Um, a direct economic loss total has been estimated at $1.6 billion in the US and 3.3 economy wide. So those indirect costs are $3.3 billion just because of high path. Taxpayers invested over $990 million in the response. $200 million of that went to indemnity costs. So the birds that were terminated to stop the spread of the disease those producers got $200 million because, as a result of that. 17 trading partners instituted a, a, a trading ban. 38 uh, inflicted a regional ban of U.S. poultry. So it really hit us economically hard for the U.S. poultry industries. This is why I have a job. My job didn't exist until after high path. So. So to bring it back closer to Minnesota and taking a look here, Minnesota accounted for 47% of all of the cases of high path flu in 2014-2015. It affected 10% of our turkey inventory, um, destroyed about 4 million layers in 110 farm sites, which is that 47% of 23 of our 87 counties. So expectations for preventing another event like this ended up 
all turning towards biosecurity. Okay? Biosecurity could help prevent or reduce the introduction of a highly of an infectious disease in any animal. But we were really concerned about preventing this again in the poultry industry. Enter the National Poultry Improvement Plan, or NPIP. NPIP is a collaboration between regulatory agencies and industry. And they've been working together for since the 30s, basically to eradicate salmonella in poultry products. But they've done a lot of other things now because the poultry industry has demanded it. So they have a general conference committee, and they all gathered. So here's state officials, USDA officials, and industry all sitting in a room. And they decided that they needed to come up with um, some accepted minimum biosecurity practices in order to help prevent another outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. This all means something, I promise. So they developed 14 biosecurity principles. One of them is a biennial audit, and the, each audit will be completed by the official state agency. In Minnesota, that's the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, which is overseen by the Department of Agriculture. Every other state will be a little bit different. Remember this map, okay? Because we had 47% of these um, confirmed cases of high path. Minnesota decided that we needed to jump on board right away with the fact that these 14 principles were instituted by NPIP and obviously with the blessing of USDA. That biennial audit has to happen every two years. It has to be audited by the official state agency, then that report goes to the USDA. The consequence of not having your audit filed every two years you will not get indemnity should you have another case of high path uh, avian influenza. So there is pretty intense complication or consequences if they don't have their audit on file. So Minnesota, being the leader that we are with the 47% of the confirmed cases, decided that even though this rule wasn't in full effect in August of 2017 when it was decided, hey, we're going to do this, but just like all large corporations or organizations, it takes a while to institute a bylaw change, et cetera, et cetera. So it was only a temporary rule in August of 2017, uh, I'm sorry, 16. And by that point, then our um, poultry specialists in the state, Dr. Dale Lauer and Shauna Voss, Dr. Shauna Voss, approached me to say, hey, we're gonna start asking our producers to start writing these plans we need some help. We're the regulating agency. We can't hold their hands while they're trying to write these plans. No other animal agriculture industry is required to write a plan and submit it to the USDA. Yes, there's pork quality assurance, which has similar kinds of concepts. Yes, there's beef quality assurance that sort of has similar concepts, but it is not required for them unless it's from the processor. The NPIP biosecurity plans in the poultry industry is a whole new ball game. Trying to get a producer to write a biosecurity plan when it's all up here, but put it on paper for a regulator, which they don't like to begin with, to approve to say yay or nay was going to be a challenge. So that's when the uh, Board of Animal Health did approach me and Extension to be able to help provide outreach to these producers um, to help them along with this process. I needed to be able to tell them and help guide them through the process of writing so that they could put their intent of their minimum management practices. They needed to write what they were actually doing on their plan, not what they thought we were supposed to see or what they thought was right. They just they literally needed to write what are they doing on their farm. They also needed to write in their plan what are general disease prevention measures. They're things they're already doing on their farm every day with every new load of birds, whether they're turkeys or chickens, what are they doing on a daily basis and will they write it down on paper? And all of these audits now have to be complete, their first audit, by September of 2020. In the state of Minnesota, we have approximately 45% of our audits done. 
being that we are the number one turkey state in the U.S., we also Candy Ohio County, which is about two hours west, is the largest turkey producing county in the United States. There's about 1,500 premises in the state of Minnesota that have to be audited. New Mexico has one. <laughs> so Dr. Lauer and Dr. Voss knew they were going to have a fair amount of work. So to try to get this accomplished is still an interesting task. So what do I do? I have statewide responsibilities. How am I going to connect with every person on all 1,500 of those premises to be able to get them to write a plan? We're going to have the early adopters, of course, but what are we going to do with the other people? So I decided, how am I going to reach all those people in the least amount of time? Well, there's this thing called the internet. It was invented when I was in high school. It's pretty fabulous. And then there's this other thing called YouTube, which I've already used a lot of. So I was like, oh, well, I'll take the regulatory speech, not speech, okay, the document is five pages long for 14 principles. It's really in regulator speak, okay? <laughs> so the majority of my producers aren't going to read that, and they're not going to understand. They're going to see one big word, and what are they going to do? Oops, oh, I don't need to do this. I'll call up Jim Bob, who's in college. He'll do it for me, okay? So my point with using YouTube was, I'll just explain it to them. Rather than having 1,500 different meetings with 1,500 different producers, I'll just say the same spiel in three minutes or less, 12 of the 14 videos are less than three minutes, explaining what that means for them and maybe some possible examples. Um, for example, one of the principles is actually um, water source. In Minnesota, we can't use surface water because we don't have the surface water half of the year. So surface water meaning some southern farms can use pond water to um, power wash their barns. Does that make sense? We don't do that here because we don't have that as a reliable source 12 months out of the year. Um, so that was an example I could give to the producers here in Minnesota that they weren't necessarily going to be able to read in the regulatory text of those guidelines. So then I was like, well, maybe there's some further details that should probably be added. So I utilized Blogger, which I believe is part of Google, isn't it? Okay. And wrote a blog post. And then I was able to embed the YouTube video into the blog post. I thought I was totally winning. Um, how I was able to distribute it, because we talked about that with Julie's presentation, was Essentially, I did a dribble effect. Starting in the middle of September of 2017, the commodity groups, uh, meaning the Minnesota Turkey Growers and the Chicken and Egg Association of Minnesota, send out a weekly email on Friday mornings. So I was able to be front and center for 14 straight weeks on that e-newsletter, and that's how I got the, really the beginning and the jump start of uh, disseminating this information. But they were looking at this blog post. And then I'd have this really annoying blurb at the top of every blog post that says, okay, so here's all these resources in this post just itself. You need to go to this Google Drive to download it. So I was essentially using three different platforms. I was getting the job done, but I wasn't as satisfied with it because I didn't know what other options I had to put it into one solid single location. Are you following me? But Allison has this cool little every other month or is it quarterly? The tech group. Every other month. Every other month, the technology education coffee with colleagues. And we all get on a Google Hangout or a WebEx or a Zoom and we all talk about how we use technology in our programming. And some colleagues in the Center for Family Development had used Qualtrics as a classroom. I was like, hmm, that's really pretty cool. Because then that means I didn't have to use Moodle, and I didn't have to use Canvas, which in a university setting are going to be the default type online classroom settings, right? How many of you are out of universities? Okay, so you're familiar with using Moodle or, Cons or uh, Canvas. However, the University of Minnesota is phasing out Moodle. Canvas is now our go-to starting next fall, uh, the fall semester. But there's still some pretty um, cumbersome parameters 
trying to use Canvas for a non-enrolled student. So in order for just Jim Bob the farmer who wants to access this information, he's going to have to get a university ID, which we call our X500, and log in and do all this kind of rigmarole to try to get the information and access it from Canvas or previously the Moodle site. And some of our online courses, totally different ballgame. But for this, when I wanted it available to anybody and they could just go and just get it done, I didn't want them to have to go through these extra steps because again, what were they gonna do? I don't wanna do this. I don't need to give the university my information. Why should I do that? So then, that's when, ta-da, <laughs> call tricks. And literally, they've changed this brand like within the last six months to say experience management. And it's really, I think, very fitting because you are managing their experience. Whether you're going through a survey type information, whether I create a video for a city who wants to have a backyard chicken ordinance, but feels they need to um, test the competency of their residents <laughs> before they get a chicken permit, I can do that in Qualtrics too. And they take the test, and if they pass the test, they get a certificate. So there's a lot of different experiences that you can use and build within Qualtrics, and I want to share with what I did and how I combine the YouTube videos, the blog posts, and the um, Google Drive into one learning center, and you can access it. It is mobile friendly. I haven't looked at it lately, but there, um, you can get to this website. Otherwise, at the end of the presentation, we've got iPads up here if you guys want to pull out a laptop. People are writing it all down. So this is actually a picture of what the blog post initially looked like. And here's what um, the MPIP, or the Qualtrics Learning Center actually looks like. I realize it's a lot uglier than what Canvas might make it look like, but it's getting the job done. So there's all sorts of ways. The menu stays on the left side. You can get to any of the resources. How should you get started? And then literally all 14 biosecurity principles are there and you can return back and forth um, to where you need to be. It doesn't save where you were, so you can just start over again. You can revisit locations. Um, here we're gonna check out wild birds, rodents, and insects. There's the video. Watch time was very important. People aren't gonna click on it unless they think it's gonna be 52 minutes long. Um, I have all the principles translated to Spanish. There's other links to training information. And because Qualtrics is typically known as a survey tool, uh, I have a survey question on the bottom of each page. Uh, to be honest, I haven't looked at what those metrics look like these days. Um, but the other thing with Qualtrics is we can also track usage. How many people are actually entering and looking and how long are they on the page for. So for my extension needs, I can track that. Yes? Okay, so all what you're showing us is in Qualtrics. So how did you, so you got to do your own background? We have university, we have templates set up through the university. Um, and here's essentially our building frame, our back end of what it can look like. Um, so. I've been able to, you know, here's the record keeping template. So if I was to do a survey, this would actually be like question one. Here's question one. And I can include all of that information there. I'm really skipping through a lot of important details, but I just wanted to give you the concepts. Mm -hmm. So you can go in and um, revise it in HTML, or you're gonna go into a rich content editor, and then that's where you would actually do your physical editing, where you would embed the image of the um, record keeping templates here. That's how you would embed the videos, the hyperlinks, everything. Um, and then I can go here to preview and it's gonna show me what it will actually look like on a PC and on a mobile device. That's super important, I think, 
these days is to make sure it is friendly for a mobile device. Um, I'm getting increasingly frustrated with websites that are not mobile friendly. Um, what else did I want to show you? Oh, so, and then to make it look the way you want it to look, why is that not? Haha, this is the flow. So this is like your building block. So this is how you can make sure everything is sorted so that it's gonna look the way you want it to with the menu, with the main menu on the front screen. You can still customize your introductory paragraph. Um, there's just, I still wouldn't have been able to do it without Allison because she really guided me through a lot of it. Um, and I'll say it even though I probably shouldn't. I prefer this method because I can control its content rather than going through the actual website um, for the University of Minnesota. It, it is linked on the University of Minnesota extension page, but I can control this. So if I need to add content, revise something, um, add another translation, another language translation, I can control that and I can release it and push it out when in a more appropriate time and taking out another step. But it is branded all University of Minnesota. So um, I would say 11 states for sure I know are sharing this just because it's so simple and because we started so much earlier. The final rule didn't go into effect until September of last year. So there's states who haven't actually even started this process in getting the producers to write a plan. Is that across all states, regardless if they've had a outbreaks? It's regardless of, of what, if they have an industry. So the de definition for commercial poultry farm, the production numbers are actually quite high. Um, so there'll be game farms that have 50,000 birds annually they're not big enough to have to do an audit. Okay, we're, we're about number four or five. Yep. Yep. So, so the, the required facilities that are of, are of a certain production number annually, that's required regardless of what state they're in. Um, and, it's just, and it's only for high path indemnity. They can opt out. Um, but Minnesota oh, breeder um, facilities are not required to go through this process. But in Minnesota, Minnesota is requiring them because they are supplying to the larger farms like Jenny O Turkey Store or any of the Wilmer Poultry. So those breeding facilities, even if they're um, regardless of their production numbers annually, they, they have to go through that audit. So do you do quizzing this way too then? I do not. No. So this is not like no, and there's no, this isn't supposed to be tied to a certification. There is a whole other new risk management assessment <laughs> that's coming out um, that will sort of quiz them, but that's, it's not a certification process. It's just a matter of what you're doing. Is it good enough? Is it, could it be better kind of a thing? That's a whole different scenario, a whole different website. So at, yeah, at this point there's, so um, biosecurity principle number one is having a biosecurity coordinator. And it just says your biosecurity coordinator has to know something about biosecurity. That's really objective. <laughs> Subjective, I should say. <laughs> so if I know the definition of biosecurity, does that make me qualified to be a biosecurity coordinator? So, so no, there's no quiz to this. Um, now granted, I'd love to quiz the 4-H kids. In fact, I do, <laughs> but no, there's no certification that goes with this. It's just a matter of having your plan written. Other questions? All right, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how much content Abby had in her uh, Qualtrics system until I took a peek this morning, and I'm very impressed. Are those license very expensive, or do you know anything about that? I do not. Allison might know better than I. Oh, for Qualtrics? Oh. The U of M, yeah. Qualtrics? 
they at least were. I don't know if that's still the case, but um, yeah. So we have just an organization-wide license. Um, I, I believe you can have an individual license with some free account options, um, but I'm not real up to date on what those limits are. But we can take a look after if you want. Okay, so this um, last part of content will be a little more of a high overview of some things. Um, I, I will share some ways that we've been using mapping for teaching and then showing program impact. Um, and at the end, this next slide, um, I have a handout that has short links for each of these examples if you wanna look at it later on. Um, to remind yourself of anything. But so th there's a lot of different ways you can use mapping tools and they're becoming more and more user friendly. Um, a lot of them you don't need to know anything complicated. They're just as easy as like Abby was showing you on the, the Qualtrics basically text editor and copy paste and um, you're good to go. So there are a lot of different ways that we're using these tools. Um, and if the internet is working nicely today, I'll see if I can just show them to you directly. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so the first one is an example of how um, our forestry program is using a story map in a narrative way to show the impact of their programming in one geographic area. And this uses Esri story maps in the cascade format with an ArcGIS um, map kind of assisting in the background. So basically they wanted to be able to show the, the impact of a program over time and why it exists um, in a way that both reassures donors that this long-term program is building to something um, and also gives participants kind of some background. So, Basically, our north shore of Lake Superior used to have a lot of um, pine trees, and then there was uh, forest fires and logging. And um, as a result, let's see where I lost my way to zoom down. Um, as a result, we ended up with a bunch of a bunch of um, birch now that is kind of ending its its lifespan and so they're doing some work to restore the the natural forest and so they're this is the description of that um, and then they start talking about the program that they're doing um, and it has a couple of components that we show in maps so basically here's here's the area that we're talking about the project is doing two things one is um, planting and protecting some uh, pine trees and the other is uh, working in cohorts of people so that they learn about planting and protecting and um, restoring the forest. So this is, per this is a map that demonstrates the participants um, over I think three years participating in this 80 hour class about caring for trees in the woodlands and so it shows just kind of geographically how they're spread up our North Shore. And then this is a demonstration of how the tree um, planting sites have been spread again in the same geographic area. And then at the end, um, there's a call to action. Like if you're interested, here's how you can, you know, donate or participate in the program. So that's an example of a narrative project map. So there's, there's some map in there, but it's largely um, a story. Another one is RSDP, our Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, is a program that's really hard to explain. Um, and so they started using a story map to try to explain it. So basically there are five regions in our rural parts of the state that have, uh, that have community groups that then um, can determine funding and um, research partnerships, that sort of thing with the university. And 
it's hard to, that can be a lot of different things, basically sustainable development in rural areas. So they wanted to be able to visually explain this. And so um, this story map is just, just a map with some stories on it. Um, and we can zoom around by region. Um, and we've outlined the regions that's done with ArcGIS. And then we can click either in this space or over here to get to um, the details. So you see an image of, that represents the project and then some more details. Some of them have hyperlinks at the bottom where you can learn more details, um, like this, for example, that links out to, to more information. Um, but it just gives you kind of a nice little overview of all the different kinds of things that this can entail. Um, so that's a nonlinear, um, short narratives about many projects across a state, our state, so any geographic region. Okay. Um, the next thing I'll show is farm rates. Um, it's a fusion table. So unfortunately, fusion tables are going away, but I just want to show kind of the functionality and how we are um, planning to adapt. So basically, um, our team that deals with farm rent value um, had a, I think it was a PDF somewhere buried on our old website. So they got all kinds of phone calls about, you know, what are reasonable rent rates and um, how is it different in different parts of the state? And they had this PDF, but it wasn't very um, user-friendly or easy to find. And so we helped them create something that was vis visual. So people can click on their county or the county that they're interested in to get um, some basic information. It's color-coded based on the USDA rents, which they deemed the most important. Um, of the several numbers that then we have in, in this um, table. And then there's the table down here with all of them. You can also click from here. So this is a Google product um, called Fusion Table, which unfortunately is degrading in August and going away entirely, I think, by December. But um, this gave us a way to start this project. Um, and it was very user-friendly. And now we are moving toward um, I believe we'll be doing this as an ArcGIS map. Um, and so we've, we've replicated some of the functionality. There will be some development time needed to make the, the spreadsheet look the same. Um, but basically, this is another way you can do a similar thing. So this is ArcGIS, and the other one was Google Fusion Tables. And the, the moral of that story partly is just that just start with a tool that you can and we have no control over what technology does, particularly things like Google, bring in new products and retire old ones and we just need to keep rolling with it. But once your content is there, it's, it's a spreadsheet and so it's very easy to change. A lot of mapping is just getting a great spreadsheet together, that's the hardest part. Um, another example that I like is one of our communications teams for community development created, uh, this is a Google product, um, and it's, it just helps people find contacts. So it's county-based contact information, and it's created with Google My Maps. So anyone can use this, and you can just click on a county outline, and you find out who you can contact for their program areas. So. Very, oops, very user friendly. It embeds in a website beautifully. Um, so just another way to use just information based map, county based contact information in our case. The next one I'll show is a story map traveling through space. Um, this isn't one that we've used yet, so I'm just showing you an example um, that they have. So earlier um, we shared a, a, a timeline in the invasive species program. That's also done with this Night Labs, um, with a Night Labs program. So this is a nonprofit organization. So these tools are free. Um, there's, their story map uh, specializes, I would say, in this traveling. It's best for stories that travel across space 
over time in, in a linear way. So they tell good story. They're able to tell stories about immigration or, I mean, like migration of, of the Americas or, um, I don't know, just how different things pass across geographies over time. And, and you can see all these different logos. There's things like videos or images, um, blog posts or audio recordings that, that can be shared. Um, and again, that's, that's a completely free tool. ArcGIS we use most often because we have um, a license at the university here. And there are, again, some free versions of that for, for people who don't have that, that um, ongoing license. And then the last one I'll show is another night lab um, option. It's called Juxtapose. It can be a map, but it doesn't have to be a map. It's an overlay of images that may or may not be map-like that can show evolution over time. And so, let's see. So basically, you just have two images that can line up, and then you can see how they've transitioned over time. Yeah, and it's, it's a free tool, which is pretty cool too. Thank you.